find you just like to invite you to turn to Daniel chapter 3 once again this evening. And you remember the scene from a couple of weeks ago. King Nebuchadnezzar had built a 90 foot by 9 foot statue, potentially representing himself or the Babylonian Empire, the deities behind both of those things, and demanded the conformity of worship to this image. And that brings us to the severe test of three young men. And you can imagine the scene, everyone is assembled. The three young men are not bowing to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. They are captives in enemy territory under a despot with a final word. There is no help in sight for them. And what awaits them is an impending fiery demise. There's no Daniel here to lead them. They are on their own. There is the crowd, the pressure. And remarkably, in what we'll see tonight, they get a second chance, which I think amplifies the pressure that they are facing. What they will face is a loss of position, loss of power, loss of influence, loss of status, the loss of their own lives. And all of that could be ameliorated if they will simply go through some motions, the motions that everybody else is doing. And yet they maintain a voice for the Lord in the midst of significant trial. One particular temptation they could face is as young Jewish men in exile thinking, hey, we're in positions of power. We need to hold our cards close to the vest and wait for the opportune moment because you never know what kind of influence we might have for our beloved Zion while here in Babylon. And yet the line that must not be crossed for them is a line of obedience, fundamental obedience at who will be worshiped and who or what will not be worshiped. Let's read together, pick up our story in Daniel chapter three, verse eight. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a, bur a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. What we're looking at this evening is a miracle on the plain of Dura. Just outside of Babylon, just outside of the city proper in the province of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar has set up this statue and he has brought all of his dignitaries from all over the empire to come and to pledge loyalty and fealty to him, conformity to the empire, and to do so by worshiping this image. Everyone is there. And we will see here a miracle unfold. And we're going to watch this miracle unfold in the plains of Dura in three speeches. Three speeches. The first speech that helps unfold this drama and what God is doing here in a miracle is the malicious accusation by jealous colleagues. 
a malicious accusation by jealous colleagues. I want you to see in Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, there's a little bit of a space here. The, the three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or we call them by their Hebrew names, Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah. I got them out of order. They are not immediately tossed into the flames. There's a little bit of a, a space here, and it seems that they went unnoticed. They have apparently not shown up for this gala event and sat on the front row to be seen by everybody, to, to hobnob with all the dignitaries in the most prominent place because they are not right in front of Nebuchadnezzar's grandstand. Apparently, they are not noticed by him. He, he doesn't see their silhouettes of, of these three Jewish men breaking the horizon of a uniform sea of bowed-down dignitaries. Are they off to the side a little bit? Are they, are they on a corner? Are they on the fringes of this crowd on the plain? They're, they're not noticed immediately by the king. And until these accusers come forward, what would they have been thinking? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Standing out of Nebuchadnezzar's gaze, are, are they waiting silently to see what will happen? Are they trembling? Are they praying? Are they fearful? Are they hoping to skate by unnoticed? Well, whatever their hopes may have been, they're dashed in verse 8. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. These Chaldeans, uh, this is a subset of the Babylonian ethnicity. The Chaldeans were the ones who were particularly specialized in astronomy and astrology. They were great with numbers. They had mapped out the heavens, and they took their accurate uh, predictions of astronomical features and turned it into omens. So they were at the same time your head honcho JPL astronomers and your tarot car reader astron uh, astrologers, uh, both holding the, the same office. That was their job. They were highly respected. And they were a subset of what were properly Babylonians. You, you knew that Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, this is the, the southern area of Babylon that eventually conquered all of Babylon and then ruled the Babylonian Empire. They were the elite caste politically, uh, intellectually, academically among all of the Babylonian hierarchy. And these Chaldeans, as you remember from chapter 1, were bypassed by some slaves from a subservient nation that Nebuchadnezzar took over with ease. Do you remember Israel? Do you remember Jerusalem and Judea and these slave captives who were taken without a fight from their homeland and their nation subjugated and paying tribute to Nebuchadnezzar from now on? Those guys, they're, they're nothing but measly slaves. And, and in their teens, they had excelled in the schooling of the Babylonians because their God had given them favor. And they leapfrogged over wiser, older, more academically trained people with tenure, people much older than them. They leapfrogged over all of these men to get high positions in the province of Babylon. You remember at the end of Daniel chapter 2, Daniel sought favor from Nebuchadnezzar to appoint Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego over high positions in the province of Babylon, the, the central province of the empire, the most important province. And these young men were given high honors, high positions, power, and influence. And so you can see what's happening here. The, the elite caste that got bypassed, expressing envy, jealousy, they, they bring charges, they bring malicious charges. Literally here, the, the, the word for bringing charges is to devour their pieces. Certain Chaldeans came and devoured their pieces before the king. Uh, we might say something like they chewed them out. Uh, it was a Semitic idiom to describe malicious intent in speech. Uh, they were bringing in malicious accusations intending personal harm. They're motivated by spite. And notice their love of power and influence even in the way they schmooze the king. Look at verse 9. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. Right? God has already determined that Nebuchadnezzar would not live forever. 
Everybody understood at this point that the Babylonian Empire would give way to others. Nebuchadnezzar's building of this statue is probably an attempt to rewrite future history. And they say, oh, king, live forever. And then, it, then they proceed with all the court formalities. Uh, they are flattering Nebuchadnezzar by repeating the law in all of its details. And I will bore you with the repetition of this law. They responded, verse 9, and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And you remember how many times we heard those words repeated in the early part of this chapter. And the buildup of all of those instruments and the, the repetition of all the dignitaries that have been summoned for this purpose and the repetition of the being tossed into the furnace of blazing fire, it, it, it almost becomes this monotonous train of repetitive wording. And they repeat it here in the presence of the king so as to flatter the glory of this brilliant law that he's put together. They are clearly on his side. Notice what happens in verse 12. After the flattery and the schmoozing and the buttering up of the king, their envy is transparent. There are certain Jews, they said, whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon. And here I think they're taking a, a dig at, at Nebuchadnezzar himself. They're uh, subtly rebuking the king. They, they are blaming him for this uncouth move. You should not have promoted Judean slaves to such high office. You should have known that such a move would undermine patriotism and loyalty and religion and the peace and stability of the realm. Nebuchadnezzar, what were you thinking is the underlying rebuke here. It is possible that they're flattering Nebuchadnezzar further by emphasizing how ungrateful those Jewish slaves must be to not heed every word of command that comes out from you. And when they say, you, O oh king, you brought these Jews in and they're not obeying you. They could be just flattering the king, but I think they're getting their digs in. Nebuchadnezzar, you should have promoted us and you promoted them instead. And, and this is malicious. This is not just a nosy, bitty, busybody Karen complaint. Sorry for any of you who are named Karen now that has taken on a new meaning. The Chaldeans want the Jewish captives' slaves sacked the Chaldeans were passed over for powerful positions. They were given, their spots were given to these upstart youths, these captives from puny Judea. Never mind that the Chaldeans owed their lives to these Judean slaves. Do you remember the scene? It was Daniel and his friends who went before Yahweh and asked for the interpretation of the dream. And, and as the henchmen of Nebuchadnezzar were making the rounds, uh, assassinating, slaughtering all of the wise guys, all of the Chaldeans, all the astrologers, all the magicians. It was Daniel who spoke up and said, don't kill them. <laughs> I have the interpretation. They owe their lives to these Judean slaves and, and they seem to have forgotten this altogether. Look, that's a good reminder for us that good deeds don't always curry favor in the face of unbelief. And I think those who follow the Lord get in trouble when they think that good deeds or somehow being liked by unbelievers has power. We give it more power than it really has. You can very quickly become a slave to wanting unbelievers to like you in order to accomplish some good end. But you have to know that when your faithfulness to Yahweh crosses unbelief, you will lose that friendship. The good deeds will be forgotten. Now, that was true in the case of these men. Uh, we ought not give more power to some sort of guarantee that, that good deeds will get us out of trouble. And I'll give you a very immature illustration of this. When I was a high schooler, I, was, um, I inherited a, a vehicle that um, ran on leaded gas. And I think some of the lead from the gas tank got into my foot, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> That lead foot um, 
had me going faster than I should have gone in, in many instances. And, and, but, you know, being a, a good kid, going to church and leading Bible studies and leading worship for youth groups, I regularly had a Bible on the dashboard. And, and some people had the ichthus on the back of the car. I just had the Bible on the dashboard. I thought that'd be enough. You know, when I get lit up and there's all of a sudden a disco ball of blue and red lights behind me and I've got to pull over and some kind gentleman in a uniform is going to have, give me a talking to, he's going to see the Bible on the dashboard. He's going, oh, you know what? This is a good kid. He goes to church. I'm not going to give him a ticket. You know, it never worked. And we get trapped into this thought that if I, if I do something good over here, it's going to curry favor to get me out of a jam. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not speeding. Uh, they've got clean consciences here. Uh, they're not in trouble with the government for any legitimate cause other than crossing the government's prohibitions about right worship of Yahweh. That's their crime. What's remarkable about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like Daniel in chapter 6, is they are accused at the level of their loyalty to God. The Chaldeans had no other dirt on them. You remember what they said about Daniel. How will we find accusation against him unless we find it in regard to the law of his God? And that's what the three friends are up against here. This leads us to a second conversation that unfolds the miracle on the plane. The second conversation, the second speech is this urgent interrogation by an angry tyrant, beginning in verse 13. Read with me there. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these men were brought before the king. First, we see Nebuchadnezzar's anger here. Rage and anger is a kind of multiplied way to say he was really mad. And what was he mad about? Nebuchadnezzar had been defied. He had been insulted. I mean, it's almost like he's saying, after all that I've done for you, you sorry ingrates, how dare you defy me? You're defying my generosity and my kindness. And think about how Nebuchadnezzar had set up this scene. I mean, he worked so hard to bring about conformity. And how peaceful his realm would have been if, if everyone thought like he did and just did what he said when he said to do it. I mean, he went to all the trouble. He, he collected all this gold. He, he had this statue built. Uh, this, this massive monument would have taken lots of work. It would have taken lots of planning for him to set it outside of Babylon City far enough so that it wouldn't be seen during construction, but close enough for everybody to conveniently get there. And then he went to all the work of assembling all the most important people of his empire, getting them all to, I mean, the logistics involved in this thing are just massive. And then there's the music. The, the psaltery, the trigon, the lyre, the bagpipe, all those instruments and the, the coordination of all of them. We're, we're not led to believe here this is just a cacophony of noise, uh, but an orchestrated musical enterprise. And for those of you who uh, conduct, you know what a challenge it is to get a bunch of instrumentalists to play the same thing the right way at the same time. It's, this would be a lot of work for Nebuchadnezzar. And, and then they had to build the furnace. I mean, it's a, a, a magnificent engineering endeavor to get this thing built out on the plane for a very specific purpose, to bring about peace and conformity and everybody doing what they're supposed to do at the same time. It's just a little incentive on the back end to just go along. And all of Nebuchadnezzar's hard work is insulted by these three young men. I mean, he'd done everything he could do to elicit conformity and loyalty. He'd, he'd worked so hard not to be defied. He didn't want it to get to this point. Look, he made it easy for everybody to conform. Why wouldn't anybody conform? What could it possibly be inside of somebody that would make them reject the, the music when it played and, and, and the whole entourage of people and the peer pressure to conformity? What could it possibly be in the heart of three young men that would get them to not bow down when the furnace is sizzling in the background? How could someone go against his wishes? He is incredulous. 
He's furious. And so the summons in verse 13. He gave orders to have them brought, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then these three men were caused to be brought before the king. You have Nebuchadnezzar's query is questioning in verse 14. He responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? And notice Nebuchadnezzar here repeats two charges, not three. He leaves off the first one. The first one, the Chaldeans said, they diss you, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. They disrespect you. They disregard you. He doesn't bring that one up. He just says, is it true that you don't worship my gods? And is it true that you're not bowing down to the image that I have set up? And he is interrogating them here. And then notice in verse 15, Nebuchadnezzar gives them a second chance. Now, if you are ready... If readiness is in you, literally, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, so it's like he likes saying all the names of these instruments. He's just proud of the orchestra he's put together. When you hear them all start, fall down and worship the image that I've made very well. So here's the second chance. And I don't know about you, I kind of like Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, you know, when you're reading a story and your heart sort of gravitates toward the protagonist. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar is an evil dude, but, but I, I kind of have fond affections for him. I want him to turn out good. It, it's like when you're watching a pirate movie, and you know what pirates do for a living. They kill people, sink ships, and steal stuff. It's illegal. It's bad. It's evil. It's wicked. And yet you're watching a pirate movie, and the pirate's the main character, and you're like, I want him to win. No, he shouldn't win. <laughs> this is terrible. But my heart is drawn toward Nebuchadnezzar and I have this soft spot in me when he's given them a second chance. Man, what a nice guy. And I'm sure he thinks he's a nice guy in this. He could have just immediately tossed him into the fire. And he says, is it true? And he calls them by name. That means that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, renamed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, must have been doing their jobs well. They must have been impressive to the king. They must have had a level of integrity and work ethic that benefited the empire. Nebuchadnezzar's impressed with them and he, and he gives them a second chance. So if there's readiness in you, when you hear the sound, fall down and worship. I mean, what kind of principle would keep you from doing that? Surely you would not choose your principles over your life. You, you wouldn't choose your principles over, over my kindness here. So, okay, orchestra, look, we're going we're gonna to start up the music again. Uh, cue the band. And, then, and now when you hear the music start, and listen, the, the orchestra is going to start their song again for three guys. And you have to be thinking, everybody else around them is going, look, we, we just bowed down. What's the big deal? Why do those guys got to stop everything? Why, why do they got to be gunk in the works? Uh, why, why can't they just be like everybody else? And, and Nebuchadnezzar, you know, we'll, we'll start the music over for you. And then the threat comes a second time, in the second part of verse 15. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. Again, the word immediately indicates that the furnace is already blazing. And again, this was the smelting furnace, most likely for, for metals. It would have been really, really hot. It, it would have been uh, possibly built like their brick kilns, which would have been thousands of degrees. This would have been terrifying. The, the smoke of this thing, probably fueled by coal, would have been black billowing out the top. This would have been a, a serious threat, a serious intimidation to any sane man who was not loyal to something bigger than Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has to make a public display of anyone who'd defy. To adapt the words of the dread pirate Roberts, Nebuchadnezzar can't afford to make exceptions. I mean, once word gets out that a tyrant has gone soft, it's nothing but work, work, work all the time. He's just got to make them pay. And then you have the last sentence of verse 15. And this is a theological throwdown. Nebuchadnezzar says, and what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Now, 
And whatever you felt for Nebuchadnezzar up to this point just goes away. You say, oh, protagonist, I kind of liked you. But don't say that. Don't say what God is there that can snatch you out of my hands, that can deliver you from me and my power. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, don't say that. This is an open challenge to the one true God. Look, it does not go well for those who challenge Yahweh, for those who defy him to act on behalf of his beloved people. Nebuchadnezzar here is picking a fight and not with three youths, but with their God. You know, in medieval combat, the medieval knight would throw down his glove. It was called the gauntlet. It was a tight-fitting glove at the fingers, oftentimes armor-plated, and it had wide wrists. It was there to, to protect his wrists in, in combat with weapons. And he would take off his gauntlet, and he'd throw it on the ground in front of another knight. And if the other knight picked it up, he was accepting the challenge. And here Nebuchadnezzar has thrown down the theological gauntlet. This polytheist in chapter 2 had tipped his hat to the God of Israel. But now in saying, what God is there that can deliver you out of my hands? He is putting himself above Yahweh. And he's putting himself above every other conceivable God. All the pantheon of 50 some odd deities in the, in the Babylonian uh, polytheism. He's putting himself above all of them. What God exists, he says, that could possibly deliver you? And think about the scene. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar is stage front on his platform. The three young men have been pulled out of whatever corner they were standing in in obscurity. They've been called out by the accusers and brought front and center and interrogated by Nebuchadnezzar. He's here. The three guys are there and the fire's right there. What could possibly interfere with Nebuchadnezzar tossing these guys into the fire? Remember in Exodus chapter 5, when Pharaoh said, who's Yahweh that I would listen to him and give up my slaves? Remember how that turned out? Pharaoh and his army and all his busted wagons at the bottom of the Red Sea. Remember Sennacherib, king of Assyria? He sent his men to capture Jerusalem. He sent Rabshakeh to taunt Israel. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 18. This is the Assyrian invasion of Judea. And, and you remember the setting of Daniel is the Babylonian captivity of Judea. That means the Assyrians weren't successful. And keep that in mind as we read Rabshakeh's taunt here, beginning in verse 33. He comes to the wall in Jerusalem and says, Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Savarphaim and Hena and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their land from my hand that Yahweh should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? And the people were silent. They'd been ordered to be silent. Turn to chapter 19, verse 32. Thus says Yahweh concerning the king of Assyria. Rabshakeh was representing the king of, of Assyria, Sennacherib. And he says, Sennacherib will not come to this city or shoot an arrow there. He will not come before it with a shield. He will not throw up a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, by the same he will return. He will not come to this city, declares Yahweh. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then it happened that night that the angel of Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh, now, when you study your Christology and you find out who the angel of Yahweh is, 
This is striking. Who is it that sets out to protect God's people, to secure for them the blessings that he has promised? The second person of the Trinity, the pre-incarnate Christ. And he goes out against the Assyrians struck 185,000 in the camp. And when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. I love that line. <laughs> What'd you do this morning? Ah, woke up dead. <laughs> so Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. That's the capital of Assyria. It came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adremelech and Sharezer killed him with a sword and they escaped into the land of Ararat and Esarhaddon, his son, became king in his place. It, it does not go well for Pharaoh, does not go well for Sennacherib and Rabshakeh, does not go well for the long history of kings who have opposed God's purpose and God's people. And here Nebuchadnezzar has aligned himself on the wrong side of history. He has thrown down the gauntlet before the God of the universe. And that challenge is picked up by three courageous young men. Here's the third conversation that unfolds the miracle on the plane. It's a costly declaration, a costly declaration from faithful servants. Let's read verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. They do not make a defense here. There is no defense to be made. They actually are guilty of the main charge. They didn't bow down and worship the statue. There's nothing that needs to be said about that. They're not going to bow down and worship the statue. They don't need to explain themselves. They are unapologetically guilty, and they are calm, collected. Look at verse 17. If it be so, that is... If we're really going to be thrown in the fire for not worshiping the image, then you need to know some things. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. First of all, notice they said, our God, whom we serve. They are servants. The same word, servant, slave. They describe their loyalties here as service to Yahweh, service to God. Slavery is a human condition, by the way. All of us are born slaves of sin. Jesus said, if you sin, you're a slave of sin by definition. That's just who we are. That's how we're born. And if you are freed from slavery to sin, Romans chapter 6, you are thereby made slaves of Christ. Right? Everyone's a slave. The question is, who is your master? Will you serve a master that seeks to destroy you, to kill you, to make promises that can never be kept and to fool you in the end with eternal destruction? Or will you serve a master who considered himself the servant of men in coming and laying down his life on behalf of those whom he loved? A master whose intentions are always good. A master with unlimited power who serves no other, who at whose name one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. These young men recognize their servanthood, their slavery. They are devoted to Yahweh. They serve him. And if Yahweh is their master, what can some petty, temporary, underling, usurper king say with any weight? This is really helpful for us. You have to understand that these young men submitted to Nebuchadnezzar as far as they could. And the line in the sand for them was at the level of obedience and disobedience to the one to whom they were truly servants. So this little phrase, our God whom we serve... <laughs> Now, a tyrant, a king, a despot who is used to getting his way, he says it and it gets done, is not accustomed to having people say, hey, yeah, I live in your kingdom, but I have another master. I answer to him. That is what these young men say. 
And they said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. It is a direct answer to Nebuchadnezzar's claim. Who could deliver me? What God could deliver you from my hand? Oh, the God whom we serve. He's able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And I love these able statements. Our God is able. What is it? You think this is something he can't do? And Nebuchadnezzar has already seen some of Yahweh's power. Yahweh read his thoughts when he was in his bed, all alone, at night. God knew what he was thinking. God troubled him with a dream. God gave him the interpretation of the dream. God did things in Nebuchadnezzar's presence, graciously, kindly, that no one else could do. And yet Nebuchadnezzar just added the God of Israel to his shelf of other gods, his other knickknacks. And in the end, when it came down to it, in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, who is God? Nebuchadnezzar. Higher than any deity in his own mind. And yet we have these statements about what God is able to do. God is able to do to overcome Nebuchadnezzar's little tyrannical power. Listen to these able statements from Scripture. Hebrews 7.25, God is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God by Christ. Jude 24, God is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless in his presence, blameless with great joy. Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we ask or even think. 1 Timothy 1.12, God is able to keep that which I have entrusted to him unto that day. Philippians 3.21, God is able to bring all things into subjection to himself. All things. Every enemy will bow the knee and confess with the tongue that he is Lord. And, and notice what the young men say next. God is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. What's remarkable is this, the first statement is about what God is able to do. The second was, one is about what God will do absolutely. And what they claim God will absolutely do is deliver them out of Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And do you know how God might do that? Through martyrdom. If they die as martyrs, guess who's not in charge of them anymore in an earthly sense? Nebuchadnezzar. It's like our old slavery to sin. You know, the, the union with Christ in Romans 6 is a union with his death. We were therefore buried with Christ into his death and raised unto new life. That fundamentally changes your relationship to sin. If you were a slave of sin and you die, the old slave master can't tell you what to do anymore. He doesn't have authority. Well, that old slave master will usurp and try to tell you what to do. And so the command in Romans 6 is don't give your implements to that old slave master as weapons of unrighteousness but present yourself before your new king. But he has no authority. Nebuchadnezzar has no authority over a dead Shadrach. And what happens to them if God delivers them out of Nebuchadnezzar's hand through the fire, through martyrdom? This is their eternal perspective. Then the exile is done for them. They are safely home. They're at rest. Look at verse 18. But even if he does not, and this picks up the first part of verse 17, if, even if God does not deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, let it be known to you, O king. You, you need to know something. And, and let's look at this first half of this phrase in verse 18. They are affirming God is able to preserve them. They don't doubt God's power, but they also do not presume on God's plan. Verse 17 was confidence and truth about God. He's able. He's able to get us out of the fire. And verse 18 is submission to the will of God. If he does not, God's will for them might be different than what they desire. Comfortable outcomes are not always God's plan for his precious ones under trials. There have been many martyrs in Scripture throughout church history Listen, they don't know, they cannot know if it would be good for them to survive or to be killed. God knows what is best. Are we tempted to complain at times as a response to God's answers to our prayers? God, get me through this trial. 
Um, we're often praying, God, get me out of this trial. We're, we're not often prone to pray, God, let me get from this trial what you intend. Get me from this trial. <laughs> and what if God knows better? To, to sustain us in a trial. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't know what God's will is. They know what God is able to do. They don't presume upon what God will do. But this is worship. This is resolute faith. The obedience of these three young men was not contingent on a favorable outcome. Notice, they say, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods and we are not going to worship the golden image you set up. Um, by the way, they are unmasking idolatry here. <laughs> We're not going to serve your gods. Um, let your gods come and make us if they were such things. Your gods can't see. They can't hear. They don't even eat the food you put in front of them. They don't do anything. You made them. We're not afraid of them. We will not serve them. I love the phrase here in the original Aramaic. Paying homage to your gods, not happening. It's abrupt. It's really remarkable. And the image you set it up. Nebuchadnezzar, that statue out there, that audacious gold monstrosity <laughs> glimmering in the sun, you, you had it built. You, you contracted it out. It's not a thing to, to be worshipped. It's not animate. It, it has no power. It just sits there. Nebuchadnezzar, you made it. <laughs> really remarkable. They're ready to die in loyalty to Yahweh. We're not paying homage to your gods. We're not falling down before the statue. We will be subject to the king right up until the point where you try to make us worship someone other than Yahweh. Dale Ralph Davis summarized their response of faith well. He said, faith knows the power of God, verse 17. I know what God's able to do. Guards the freedom of God. I don't know what God will do. And upholds the truth of God, verse 18. We're not worshiping your gods. That is a picture of real faith. And they echo the sentiments of Job, Job 13, 15, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Matthew 10, 28, similarly, Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. This is the miracle on the plane. It's already happened. There's another miracle coming. We'll get to that next week. Uh, spoiler alert, God does rescue them out of the furnace of blazing fire. And no doubt, that's a miracle. But the miracle on display in this text is so remarkable. Not that God saves them, but that they would obey him even if he doesn't. Whether or not God would save them, he has already so worked in their hearts to, pursue, to produce resolute faith that will not yield ultimate loyalty to someone other than Yahweh. We don't want to lose sight of the remarkable supernatural intervention here in this text. God's work in the heart to solidify courage, conviction, and faith for these three young men. The uniqueness and the glory of Yahweh was far more critical to them than their own comfort, their own position, their likability, status, influence, wealth, or even their next breath. They would rather suffer than sin. Or as Matthew Henry put it, they are resolved rather to die in integrity than to live in iniquity. He said the saving them from this simple compliance was as great a miracle in the kingdom of grace as the saving them out of the fiery furnace was in the kingdom of nature. And you know, if they had been burnt to a crisp, the really astounding miracle stands. Three young men said, but if not, it's faith. Supernaturally given, divinely sustained confidence in God. Loyalty to God, surrender to God, submission to the one true God. Look, this story uh, is, I think, popular 
uh, on social media and in other forums. It's, it's used often as an illustration uh, in Christian writings in the last year or so because I think it sort of lends itself to an appeal to the stand against the man. These three young men are not fighting tyranny. They're not standing against a tyrannical dictator. They're not arguing against despotism. Look, up until this point, they served a despot. They did what he said. They, they, they were slaves and, and they were accountable and they lived according to a work ethic. They actually followed uh, Jeremiah's advice for exiles in Babylon. Go there, live there, build houses for yourselves, get married, have children, play for the, pray for the welfare of the land you're in. They submitted to evil governance. Daniel 3 is not anti-tyranny. It is Pro Yahweh. It, it, their example is pro God. They could make appeals. They could have a conversations. They were still going to face the fire. <laughs> they got tossed, as we'll see next week. They did not take up arms. They did not storm the Bastille. They did not cross the Delaware. They were humble, calm, resolute. They were not revolutionaries. Listen, there is a freedom under divine obligation that Christians can rest in. What is that freedom? I'm a slave of God. What God says, I want to do. And I can trust him with the results. If God says, submit to the king, pay your taxes, I serve him. And so I serve you, king. <laughs> and when the king says, hey, I'm going to build this statue and I want you to worship me. I was a good citizen. I'll still be a good citizen. You can throw me in the fire, but I'm not worshiping your statue. That is these three young men. There is a freedom in resting under divine obligation. We do what God says. The line in the sand for us is where a human earthly government tells us to disobey God, to sin contrary to God's prescriptions, to avoid doing something God commanded us to do or to do something God prohibits. Listen to Romans 14. This exemplifies these three young men. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one of them dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. But what a sweet truth that is, that you and I belong to Jesus Christ. We are his possession, purchased at a price. We are ransomed by him unto him. You know what that means? When Jesus said, no one can snatch them out of my hands, I'm his. Whatever happens in this life, whatever happens in my going out of this life, I am his. It's a comfort. Psalm 112 says this, praise Yahweh. How blessed is the man who fears Yahweh, who greatly delights in his commandments. And then in verse seven, he will not fear evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Put yourself on the plane of Dura. And the command goes, the conductor starts, and the orchestra plays, and everybody bows down. Fear Yahweh. And you will not be afraid of evil tidings. My friends, it's easy to be afraid of evil coming down the pipe. But if we fear Yahweh, he's bigger and stronger than all of that evil. We fear him. There is nothing else to fear. All right, Chris, let's, let's sing that song again. So Chris is going to come up. I'll close in prayer, and then we'll dismiss with Jesus on my cross one more time. Lord, thank you for your word, for its power, for its clarity, for its instruction to us. We thank you for its knife-edged precision, that you as a master surgeon wield the truths of your word in us, separating out motives, discerning thoughts and intentions at the heart level, 
O oh God, do your work in us. May we be your slaves, faithful to the end. We follow our Lord in these things. And we look to young men like Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. And God, we know that if we fear you, we have nothing else to fear. Strengthen us in this for your glory in Jesus' name.